No, no. Not yet. <laughs> what year are you? I'm on third year. Third year? Nice. We're getting there. What rotation are you on right now? Um, brain injury. Uh, fun brain injury. Yeah. Some months. I didn't think brain injury would do anything for me, and now I treat a bunch of concussions. So I'm like, oh, yeah. All those months of brain injury do me so good. <laughs> <laughs> What time is the next lecture? Ten thirty. Yeah, but I think there's a little bit of leeway in there. Okay. Um, yeah, we have the chiefs meeting at the end, so if things run a little long, then it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Should show up downstairs. Yeah. Hopefully, it'll stop blinking. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is Dr. Galata. She's a former chief resident here at Temple. Uh, we were there during our fourth year uh, domestic sports rotation, so we're really happy to have her. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Is the mic on? Can you hear me? I can yell. It's not. Good. Can you hear me back there? Awesome. All right. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to the interviewees. Nice to see you guys here. Temple's awesome. <laughs> I'll have to, I'm a little biased, but I think it's awesome. Yeah, is it not on? There we go. Better? All right, here we go. All right, so my lectures um, today is on traumatic cycling injuries in triathletes. Um, so it's a little bit focused, but that's because I see it day in, day out. I treat a lot of runners and triathletes in my practice just because I belong to all the groups and clubs and so they all come come my way. So I see a lot of them in my office and so it's just a fun topic to talk about. So we'll jump into some of the basically the injuries but we'll also go over some biomechanics and stuff. So um, our objectives today, uh, so we're going to look for common cycling injuries. We're going to look at diagnosis and treatment of those injuries. We'll identify some risk factors for those injuries and how can we prevent those injuries from happening. So all about preventing injuries. Um, now I have little blurbs in here. I'm going to have to skip some of them um, because... Oh, all those good things. So some of these I'm just not going to have time for. I'm going to stop this a little bit. But um, did, Do you guys see this yet? Any of the residents? Okay. Let's see if it goes. Is this more arrow or this? Oh, you can't hear it. Oh, it's, it's not going to volume. No volume. Okay. You're not going to see it. But he's going, is this more arrow? Or is this more arrow? Or is this more arrow? <laughs> this or this? <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> and you realize how ridiculous you are as a triathlete when you listen to this guy and you're like, oh my God, I actually sound like him sometimes. <laughs> All right, so here's our motto in the triathlete world. Life is simple, so everybody run, eat, and sleep. All righty, so uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of things, we have to look a little bit at cycling biomechanics to understand what's going on with our cyclists. Um, so, everybody okay? Um, and anybody else need to go to rapid response? We're good? All right. Um, but okay. Um, okay, so cycling biomechanics. So we look at resistive forces on the left side of the screen. So what do we talk about? When a person's on the bike, what's happening? Well, there's resistive forces trying to stop them from pedaling, right? So we look at the terrain, we look at the wind, we look at the humidity, we look at the temperature, those factors will slow them down. Um, rolling resistance is how the bike moves on the road. So things that are going to affect rolling resistance are the, the wheel diameter. So the larger the wheel diameter, the less resistance you have. The tube, how much air is in the tube. So a tube that doesn't have as much air will have more resistance. A tube with more air will have less resistance. And so you always see people blowing up those tubes as, as high as they can and then they blow it, then they get a flat, and then they regret it. So you always want to be, you know, a little bit below what you're supposed to be, so you don't get a flat tire. 
um, but people push it to that very, very limit. Um, and rolling resistance is also has to do with the road surface too. So the road surface will affect the rolling resistance. A nice, smooth, newly paved road obviously will have a better rolling resistance than those little bumpy ones. Um, we look at aerodynamics, which you know we we focus and focus and focus and focus on. So if you if you are in the correct streamlined race position and you're in this aero position and decrease your frontal area by 30%, then you'll really increase your speed dramatically. Tight clothing is another thing that we look at. Um, so tight clothing will decrease your drag by 30% as well. So you don't want loose, floppy clothing when you're um, on the bike. Um, your helmet, uh, there's big talk in the tri-world. If you're, if you're out of money and you have to decide whether or not you have to buy the helmet or the wheels, which one's gonna give you more of a benefit in terms of speed? the wheels I think I've looked at every study um, not I bought both so it doesn't really matter <laughs> but but um, but the helmet will make a difference to a certain extent um, then we look on the right hand side of the screen bike components so the gears the actual mechanics of the bike the shifters and everything else they have a very small influence it's nice to have those nice expensive fancy gears and electronic gears because it's nice and smooth but it's not really going to change too much in terms of your aerodynamics specifically um, uh, you can also look at the the pedal forces, seat and handlebar forces, handlebar forces minimal as long as you're in that right arrow position. The pedal forces they will play a role, um, and they're which I don't have in this lecture because it's something I looked at relatively recently. But where you start to put your force on that pedal and how that pedal transmits that force over to the crank um, will play a pretty large role in how um, arrow you are, believe it or not. And so. As you're pedaling, you don't want to make yourself less aero during the pedal stroke. So for instance, if you're going downhill um, and you're cruising at like 30 miles per hour, you stop pedaling because even if you can get to 32 or 33 miles per hour, you think you're actually making yourself less aero and you're wasting your energy. And so there's the, you gotta look at those factors as well. Um, let's look at the bike. So just a couple things I want you to see on the bike that we're gonna be talking about a lot today. Obviously the saddle here, so where the person sits is really, really important for comfort level and positioning level. We can move it back, forth, we can move it up, down, we can angle the saddle seat up and down. Um, your handlebar, which just does not show the arrow bars, but the arrow bars is where most people are at these days in the tri world. Your seat tube, um, we're gonna talk about that seat tube in a little bit. There's also the down tube here, but the seat tube and the top tube are things that we, that we look at when we're talking about the right positioning on a bike. Bad news is if somebody went out and bought a fancy bike and it's the wrong size for them, then and they need this seat tube or this top tube changed, they need a whole new bike and they're not gonna do that. So then you have to find ways to work with this and this, things that you can modify because they got the wrong size bike, which happened to me on my last bike. I got the wrong size bike. That was a newbie, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so the bike was too small, so all of a sudden I was trying to change other things and finally ended up just getting a new bike. I have one for sale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we look down here a little bit at the pedals and, and the, the crank chain and the chain system, not too much, but that's something I just want you guys to keep an eye on. Okay, so what is the ideal arrow position? Well, we look at this and we look at this, you know, we look at your seat positioning, we look at your seat height, your angle, your fore and your aft position, so how forward, how backwards you are. Um, we look at your neck position, your back position, your scapula position, your elbow position. So you want your elbows kind of shadowing right over your knees, and so you can see here, he's actually, usually your elbows are actually a little bit closer to your knee, but as he brings that hip up a little higher, it's gonna get a little closer to his knee. There's times when I actually even bump my elbow on the top of my knee, because I'm like that close. Um, and my knee will come up over my elbow, so if my elbow, if I shift around because my neck gets a little sore and I pull my elbow back, I start bumping my knee, and I'm like, oh shoot, I gotta change my position. Get those elbows back out there, so I stop bumping the top of my knee, because I'll have big bruises, because you just do it over and over and over again. Um, uh, and you also want those forearms parallel to the ground. And so in this position, he's he's about perfect. His forearms are about parallel to the ground there. So nice, tight arrow position. Um, you want your back to be horizontal. If you'll look at him, he's, he's a little tight. Um, so he's a little bit more curved, but that's just because he's trying to get all of his forces. If you look how far forward he is on his saddle, he's trying to get all of his forces down on that pedal. Um, you want as horizontal of a back as you can get. But you have to keep in mind comfort, flexibility, any other pre-existing injuries, 
natural and, and anatomical variations. And so what I often see is that, hmm, how do I make that go? There, there we go. Um, what I often see is that if they go for a professional bike fit, you know, the bike fitters will, the good ones, will look and ask you questions. Hey, what muscles are tight on you? What injuries have you had in the past? They ask those questions, but do they really know how to adjust based on your answers? Often not. Sometimes yes, but often not. So a lot of times they're going and somebody's looking at the numbers and saying, okay, your hip angle is supposed to be this and your knee angle is supposed to be that. And they put you and they're like, look, you look great. But you can't ride the bike because you're not comfortable. Something else is wrong. Maybe your hamstrings are tight. Maybe your back is sore. Maybe you have neck pain. And so, yes, you want to be as aero as possible, but you also have to be comfortable because when you're on that bike for extended periods of time, you're not going to be happy unless you're comfortable. Um, one thing that's really important in terms of you treating your athlete is knowing what they're riding. Uh, and the, so this is a comparison of a tri bike which is also called time trial bike and a regular road bike and a road bike that was fit with aero bars because you can do that you can take your road bike and say i want to be a track lead and put aero bars on it uh, but what is the difference well the difference is that so this guy in red here is the guy on the tri bike this guy in black is the guy on the road bike if you see the guy in red but on the tri bike he's lower so he's more aero um, he's longer, he's, so he's a little bit more horizontal, and he's, because he's longer here, he can open up his hips a little bit more. His, the seat tube is more angled. It's more angled, and the pedals are moved back. And what that's doing is it's bringing the forces down right over the pedal, but it's also elongating your hamstrings. So somebody with tight hamstrings might have a hard time with a tri bike, and they might be better with a road bike with an arrow position. And I will have people who are new or just getting into it who haven't bought their bike yet and are just borrowing a friend's or on their mountain bike and I'll make suggestions as to what bike they should buy based on what I see anatomically with that person. Um, somebody with a lot of back pain might have a harder time extending because this will cause a little bit more increased lordosis. And so there's certain reasons you would recommend different things. So it's important to know what they're riding or what they plan to ride and if you can help contribute to that then it's worthwhile. Um, I like to say triathlon just means I'm not very good at three different sports. <laughs> All right. So let's get into injuries. And feel free to raise your hand, ask questions, chime in as we go along. Okay. Common areas of injury. Overuse. This is all overuse, right? So in our cyclists, what do we see? And we're not talking about the ones that crash. I see those ones too, and they scare the crap on to make noise. That's going to be me next. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about what do we see because they're sitting in that bike position for extended periods of time. They're ignoring their injuries. They're not paying attention. The bike fits wrong, blah, blah, blah. Here's a chart of what we see in the office. Neck, knees, groin, hands, shoulders, back, feet, thighs, elbow, head, hips, and Achilles. So we can see a lot of things, right? But if you look here, it's predominantly all this stuff. So your neck, your knees, your groin, hands, shoulders, back. But kind of this is what we see. I see knees. I see knees after knees after knees and hamstrings after hamstrings after hamstrings. I don't see a ton of neck, mainly because I don't do neck and back pain in my office. I'll do neck and back pain for triathletes, but my office staff has a hard time figuring out who the triathlete is when they call, so they just say, no, sorry, they don't do, she doesn't do neck and back pain. Uh, so I don't see a lot of it, but it's out there. And a lot of times that goes right to the primary care physician, or they talk to their friends, and they tell their friends, hey, I have neck pain, and they get suggestions, and hopefully they can fix it on their own. Um, or they ask me when I'm out with them online. And I say, what are you doing? Your hips like, oh, I'm going to extend it. Stop doing that. Um, <laughs> so uh, but I see a lot of knee pain. I see a lot of hamstring pain. I see a lot of groin pain. I do get some hand pain every once in a while. Um, I do see some back pain because, you know, their hamstring hurts. So, of course, their back hurts a little bit. Um, another phrase. Swim like you're going to drown. Ride like you stole it. And run like they are chasing you. This used to be my total model for triathlons when I was, like, brand new with them. If I try to maintain this model now based on where I'm at with, like, Ironmans and half Ironmans and all that stuff, I'd die. Because this is, like, just all out just frantic and, like, oh, my God, just go, just do it. And it, you have to, like, learn to, like, calm yourself down because you had a long day ahead of you, right? So it's better. This is always what the beginners feel like. But as you get more into it, it gets better. Okay. Next pain. So... What kind of factors do we look at when we have neck pain? Our risk factors for neck pain are bike positioning, or your positioning on the bike, your bike geometry, and other comorbidities. And so obviously, 
this is a guy that was put into the perfect position by his bike fit guy. Like, I, I measured all of his angles. He's just right. I don't understand why he has neck pain. Look at his, like, thoracic kyphosis. <laughs> like, he's just taking this, like, woo, like, sharp angle down, and then he's trying to look up because you have to be able to see, right? And by the way, I see a lot of crashes because people, their neck muscles get tired or they get sore, so they keep their head down and they don't look up at the road and they crash their bike. So neck anatomy and treating your neck and taking care of your neck is really important so that you don't get hurt, like really hurt. Um, so when we look at this, this guy is positioned so that he's got way too much extension here and he's, he's way, 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 way too, too even here. So we need to kind of elongate this out a little bit. The, I would probably read to see up a little bit, but you have to watch your knee angles, um, and maybe even shorten the stem down a little bit, so he's a little lower, so he's evening out this thoracic kyphosis a little bit, but sometimes it's anatomical and you can't change it, so another thing you could do, you could raise the actual handlebars up as well um, as, a, as an option, but there's a lot, of, so these are things that you have to look at. Um, now... For neck pain, what do we have for a differential diagnosis in our triathletes? Majority of the time, it's just a cervical strain or weakness, muscular imbalances, and so they aren't they they aren't strengthened the right way. So that's the main thing that I see. Of course, you want to rule out things like spondylosis, herniated discs, radiculopathy, thoracic outlet syndrome. So if they're sitting there for five hours with their neck in an extended position looking up, then they could be stretching some of the brachial plexus and stuff like that. They can start to get neurological symptoms and they get freaked out and you think they have a dick and everything else. Sometimes it's just they're overextending their neck. Um, so that's something that you have to keep in mind. I have seen it twice with, with a cyclist and as soon as we fix their position, better. Um, so treatment. Modify, 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 modify that bike. You really need to modify your bike so that they're in a better position if possible. So things you can do, this guy's a little bit of an exception, the guy that was on the screen before, because he had a thoracic kyphosis that you weren't doing much about. But in general, if you shorten the stem of the handlebar, then you can get them a little bit longer. Um, that helps them a little bit. You can shorten the stem, but raise the handlebars up a little bit. Um, you can make sure that their helmet doesn't have one of those overhangs to protect them from the sun because if they've got this overhang, all of a sudden they're looking up even higher just for visibility purposes. So you want the helmet to not block their vision, um, which they hate because then they have to go buy a new helmet. They're like, what? I need a new helmet? There's not many helmets out there like that anymore. They pretty much accommodate for that now. Um, make sure that your handlebars are the right width apart, like shoulder width apart. So if they're crunched in like this, then they really, it's, it's really scrunching their, their cervical muscles, right? So their traps and their radiator scaps and everything else are getting shortened. And then that is going to cause a little bit of discomfort. Um, you want them to be less rigid in their position. So if they're riding all tight, you want them to relax their shoulders down. You want to remind them. You want to have them set an alarm. Relax your shoulders. Relax your shoulders. Send an alarm every hour or every 20 miles. Sit up, get out of the air position, stretch your neck. Don't just leave yourself in that position for an extended period of time. If I can give anybody any advice, that's probably the best advice that I can give them. Um, therapeutic program, you can send them to physical therapy. That usually does wonders for them. You want to do some postural strengthening exercises. If they don't want it, a lot of times, especially my triathletes, they don't have time to throw therapy into the mix. They really, they're just like, well, then that's going to take away from one of my workouts. And I'm crazy like them, so I get what they're saying. But at the same time, I'm like, I try and convince them that that's not good for them. Um, but if they don't go, then I give them a couple exercises that they can do on their own. I try and incorporate it into their workouts so that they don't think that they're missing anything. So I'll have them in the pool when they're swimming, and I'll have them up, and I'll have them doing this position called Tarzan position. So instead of turning your head to the side to breathe, you keep your head out of the water. It's also called alligator eyes. And you just look, and you don't lower your head, and you swim like this, and it strengthens the postural muscles in your neck really easily. It's good workout in the swim pool and it's a good workout for them to strengthen their muscles on the bike. I give them some stretching exercises, you know, I show them how to stretch. I have handouts for that um, that I can give them to stretch, but otherwise if they don't, but I would like them to go to therapy most of the time. Another thing is to modify your training. How many hours are you spending on the bike? Are you spending too many hours on the bike? Or maybe you should switch over and do some road biking so that you get the hours in that you need, but you're not always in that really stressful tri position. Um, so there's some literature, actually there's a lot of literature out there to support the fact that you don't necessarily need to always be in that tri position to train those muscles 
that way. So mm-hmm. your muscles to build up that way. A lot of triathletes think I have to train on my bike, I have to train on my bike because that's what they were taught. But if you train on your bike once a week, especially in base training, and then go into a road bike or just sit up on your bike twice a week during your training, during the other two days, if you're training like biking three days a week, then that can take a lot of the stress off of your neck. Is somebody going to raise their hand? No. Okay. okay, low back pain. Um, this is a common one. So you're going to see a lot of familiar things going on here. So we're going to talk about positioning, bike geometry, comorbidities, strength and flexibility deficits. That's why their back hurts, right? So if their tube, the top tube that we saw, if that's too long, then they're going to get increased more doses, right? And that's going to put some strain on the low back. Conversely, if it's too short, they're going to be flexed and they might develop some pain maybe in the SI joints or maybe in the up a little bit more mid back, the thoracolumbar junction region. Um, we look at their handlebar height and their seat height because that plays a big role for sure. Tight hamstrings play a huge role in terms of back pain. So tight hamstrings will cause a posterior pelvic tilt, again, increase or doses, again, contribute to the back pain. If you're pedaling in large gears, so you're riding at a low cadence, and you're cranking on those gears, that's a huge risk factor for a lot of injuries, back pain being one of them, knee pain being another big one. If you're doing too many hill climbs, if you have Lake Placid coming up and there's lots of hills and you're gung-ho and you're like, I'm gonna tackle those hills and I'm gonna do this and every ride I do is gonna be hills so I know that I can do it. You're not gonna do well. You can't do all focused hill training. You have to mix it up a little bit and some people just get a little overzealous and so that's another risk factor. And conversely, if you're usually it's the hamstrings, but sometimes it's the quads that are tight or the hip flexors that are tight, and then that'll cause an anterior pelvic tilt. And then so you can have back pain from that as well. So what what do we look for when they're in my office or what do I diagnose them with? Usually low back strain. Depending on their age, I'll probably get x-rays. So the little raw spondylosis, you know, disc, for dick, all that stuff. Um, Cancer, you have to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. A lot of your triathletes are... 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds. So especially guys, you have to watch out for prostate and metastatic cancer. I picked it up once or twice, um, unfortunately. Um, Sometimes it comes to your office and you're the one to get it or to pick it up. So treatment, modify the bike. Um, Again, here we go. We're with that modifying the bike. So there you can, depending on what the problem is, right? If their hamstrings are causing the problem and their hamstrings are tight, then you can um, you can lower the seat a little bit. What athletes tend to do, or triathletes tend to do, is they want to have the seat as high as possible, the majority of them. Why? <laughs> Why let's see as high as possible? Bless you. Hmm? It does, yes. If you transfer everything to the hamstring, then it saves your quads for the run. So that's one reason. But the main reason is because it generates more power. And so the higher your seat is, and there's studies to show that the higher your seat is, the more power you generate, even if you go beyond what's within normal physiological limits. And so there's ranges for how much knee extension you should have or knee flexion you should have at the bottom of your pedal stroke. And you really want to have about eight eight degrees of knee flexion or more at the bottom of your pedal stroke between eight and 15. But a lot of times, and people will look at their power meter and they'll go to four degrees of knee flexion and they'll say, oh my God, my power went up. I'm going to stay here but they're really overstraining their hamstrings and putting a lot of strain and overstretching their hamstrings. And so sometimes you need to convince them to shorten that seat height a little bit um, or move it forward a little bit or angle the seat down a little bit. So there's things that you can do. You can modify and tweak it. And we're talking millimeters. We might only move the seat forward one or two millimeters. We might only lower it, you know, a centimeter. Um, It's small differences, uh, but it does make a big difference. Um, you can change, again, the handlebars. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do on the bike. I usually will write a note and send it to the bike shop to say, hey, this and this is happening. Can you try and work on lowering their bike seat without injuring, without causing knee pain? Because now if you lower the bike seat and you cause too much knee flexion, now you're going to hurt your knees. And so there is a balance. But most of the time you'll identify that they're probably pushing the limits of that bike seat height when they're, when they're feeling it in their low back. Uh, shaved and tapered. I just threw that in there. That's a common triathlon theme. <laughs> All right. Hip pain. So, I swear to God, people would show up with a bike like this if they could. <laughs> Why? Why would they show up with a bike like this if they could? What do we talk about? Wheel diameter decreases rolling resistance, right? So the bigger the wheel, the less rolling resistance you have, the faster you go. 
So people will push it. They will push their limits on terms of, of wheels and, and seat heights and everything else. And so um, what I usually see when it comes to hip pain um, is bursitis and snapping hip syndrome. It's overuse. It's from the repetitive cycling. And it's usually the lateral. So it's usually the, the greater trochanteric bursa, the TFL, um, that musculature. Sometimes you get groin pain. And if you get groin pain, then you have to look at iliopsoas bursitis, internal versus external snapping hip syndrome. You guys know the difference, internal versus external snapping hip syndrome? Okay. Internal snapping hip syndrome is when the iliopsoas muscle snaps over the iliopectineal eminence. They feel the popping. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. External snapping hip syndrome is when the TFL turning into the IT band snaps back and forth over the greater choke, and the pain is out here. Really easy to pick up. They say their hip pops and snaps and comes out of socket. They always say that. Um, <laughs> pops out of place all the time. They always say that. But you can tell right away. That you can either hear it in the office or feel it yourself, or you can ask them, well, where do you feel it when it hurts? If they say the groin is internal snapping hip, if they say the out here and the outer part of the hip, then it's external snapping hip syndrome. And usually it's external. Usually it's it's the IT band snapping over the greater choke and teric bursa. Um, again, if their seat height is too high, yeah, go ahead, Ilya. Uh, iliopectineal eminence on the pubic bone. Um, so if their seat height is too high, then they're going to be stretching their hamstrings, they're going to be overextending their IT band, um, and then it's prone to snapping back and forth. But you have to be careful because the hip is a tricky little joint. So you have to make sure that there's not arthritis. You have to make sure there's not a labral injury. If you suspect it, you don't just go getting MRIs unless you suspect it. You can have AVN. I had a patient who had AVN um, after a labral repair, and unfortunately he developed AVN, which they called idiopathic, but it was after a labral tear surgery. So I'm not calling it idiopathic. <laughs> I'm calling it iatrogenic. <laughs> but, but he had to have a hip replacement. Um, you can get transient osteoporosis of the hip. So a lot of times, like for instance, one of my friends right now, she had a baby six weeks ago. She's already been on her bike for four weeks. She, she got on her bike right away two weeks after the baby was born and has been exercising. Of course, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to wait six weeks. And um, and post uh, uh, post uh, postnatal in the perinatal period, women are prone to transient osteoporosis. And if they stress their bodies too much, then that's something that you can see. And I've picked it up a couple of times in my female triathletes, mostly female. I don't think I've ever seen it in a male. So you just gotta be careful and make sure if they're not feeling better or it's just getting worse that you're looking for other causes. Um, it's, you can't always blame it on the bike positioning and things like that. So, um, but those are things that we certainly keep in mind in terms of hip pain. <clears throat> Hamstring pain, um, we talked a lot about this, so I'll, I'll go over this real fast. Our risk factors, same thing as all the other ones, um, so nothing too crazy there. So again, our seat's too high, our seat angle is off, we're putting pressure on that area. If somebody is in the right position on their bike, they're actually, they're either on their ischial tuberosity, but more likely they're on their pubic bone, so they shouldn't really be getting ischial tuberosity pain or discomfort or hamstring strain from direct pressure contact. So you, you can get tendinopathy just from overextending or the seat being too long or too or too much repetitive activity, but it shouldn't be necessarily from actual pressure. If it is, you gotta look at kind of changing changing their um, seat position a little bit. And it's hard, it's a hard position to get used to, but if you look at your your triathletes, if the world championships was just on TV this weekend, if you look at where they're sitting on their bike, you know that the bike seat is is wide in the back and then angles in, right? They're sitting right on that tip of that angle, and they're leaning so far forward, and they're sitting on their pubic bone. They're not sitting on their ischial tuberosity. They're driving more and more and more force. I can tell you it's an uncomfortable position. I can't always maintain it. A lot of times I do rock back and sit on my ischial tuberosity after a while because I need a little breather. Um, but, you know, you really should um, not be sitting on that ischial tuberosity too long. If you are, you can get a saddle sore, which is a fibroma, over the ischial bone, um, and that's a common thing. You can feel it, it's easy to feel, it's very painful. Fibroma, neuroma, because it usually brings in nerve endings with it, um, and people don't like those at all. They're tricky to treat. You gotta, you know, a lot of times you can treat them with um, Graston therapy. You guys know what Graston is? The metal instrument that the therapists use to work out all the restrictions. You can try and break down the fibroma with that. Um, so, and, and you can try some ART therapy and manual stretching and things like that, but sometimes they need surgery if that fibroma just won't go away. Oh, 
I have another video for you. It's kind of funny. It's, but we'll skip it. If we can get by him at the end, maybe we'll go back to it. We're gonna get done on time because all my little skits are, <laughs> we can't hear them. Okay, questions as we go. You guys follow me? Knee pain. All right, we're gonna spend a little bit of time here on knee pain. Because uh, I see a lot of this, probably more of this than anything else. What do I see from with bikers and knee pain? This is majority patellofemoral syndrome, patellar tendinopathy, <clears throat> IT band syndrome. So this sounds a lot like my running lecture from last year, right? These are overused, repetitive, chronic activities. This is not an ACL. You're not tearing your ACL by pedaling a bike in a single plane, right? That's not happening. You're maybe if you have mucoid degeneration of your meniscus, maybe you you and your seat height's too high, maybe you stretch too much, and maybe you have a slight tear of your meniscus. That could happen. I've seen it. My husband did it actually. Did he? Um, <laughs> why did he do it? Why did my husband tear his meniscus? He tore his posterior horn medial meniscus, and I warned him and warned him and warned him. Something was wrong, and he wouldn't listen. Hmm? His bike. Thank you. His seat height. Somebody's listening. All right. His seat height. He had his seat height as high as my seat height, and my legs are one and a half inches longer than his. I kept on telling him, lower your seat height, lower your seat height, lower your seat height. And he has really bad, tight hamstrings. They always cramp up when he runs or whatever it may be. I'm always trying to stretch his hamstrings. God awful tight hamstrings. I kept on telling him, you're putting too much strain on your posterior structures. You're going to stress something. He stressed his knee and he tore his meniscus. But luckily, we did PRP and he's done okay. Okay. So causes, training errors, like my husband, um, but also not only the seat um, bike fit, um, but <clears throat> increasing your mileage too quickly. If your cadence is too low, we, we mentioned that a little bit earlier. So if you're not spinning that pedal fast enough, there's a lot of studies to support the fact that you are putting too much stress on your joints. And so you're taking a low impact sport and turning it into a higher impact sport unnecessarily. Your cadence needs to be up around 80 or 90 revolutions per minute. And that's really hard for people to get to when they're not used to it. And most people are not used to it. And I can tell you, I'm not used to it. I was, I was a pedaler at 65, 70, because I liked, I liked pushing. I liked feeling like I was working, right? You wanted to feel like, yeah, I got this. I'm going to work hard. That's not what you want to do. You want to feel like you're not doing anything because when you're doing it for five hours, you really it will wear you down eventually. So you have to learn to increase your cadence. You have to learn to take advantage of your cardiovascular system over your muscles, especially if when you're getting off the bike to go on to the run. If you're just cranking, 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 you're not going to have anything left in your legs when you use a, a low cadence like that. You need a high cadence. You stress your cardiovascular system, which can last much longer then your glycogen supply in your muscles, and your muscles will burn out if you use too low of a cadence. Um, so another consideration with anterior knee pain, which is a lot, what a lot of this is, is tight hamstrings. Tight hamstrings, even in 16-year-old girls with patellofemoral syndrome who are cheerleaders or runners, or whatever it may be, a lot of times tight hamstrings contribute to anterior knee pain across the board, not just in cyclists. And so look at their hamstrings, make sure their hamstrings aren't too tight. Um, so sometimes we again have to go back and look at bike fit so this is an example of a person who has um, the bad visual malalignment syndrome right so cueing bad cue angle a little bit of tibial torsion causing a little bit of abduction here and they didn't adjust his feet so they didn't change his feet to match and so he got shoved into a shoe that made him go like this what happens his knee turns in Excuse me. So sometimes things are just simple fixes. You can change the angle of this and boom, problem solved. You just have to figure out that that's what's going on. Um, and a lot of times, I've never seen anybody give me a bike fit when they actually look at my angles of my feet and my knees and everything else. They just put you on and go. Um, so there's this nice handy little chart because we see a lot of knee pain. And so this is good for you guys to kind of have an idea about. Sorry, it's a little bit small, so probably hard for you to see. But when it has to do with knee pain, you always just want to let the bike fit first, almost the majority of the time. I mean, you'll do it before dam and stuff like that, so you can identify any other factors. But start here. As long as you're not in terrible pain, you start here, and you can probably fix their problem over several weeks, and they'll feel better. So saddle too high. Um, it's going to cause knee extension. It'll irritate your IT bands, put stress on the biceps tendon, increase patellofemoral loading, um, and your hips will rock because your saddle's too high, so you're not stable. So that's so um, that is why you want to make sure your saddle is not too high. Saddle too low, 
Well, stress, your patellar and quadriceps tendon, right? You're putting too much anterior forces. Your saddle's low, you're gonna hit more anterior forces. <coughs> Just like to tell people when they do a lunge, don't go over your knee, right? You lower that saddle, you're gonna change the forces too much, put too much anterior stress. If your saddle's too far forward, again, stress on the anterior knee. Uh, if your saddle's too far back, you're getting the IT band. Um, if your crank arm is too long, so your crank arm is the guy that you're pedaling against, um, it'll create increased forces across the entire knee. Why do people put big cranks um, on? Better torque, more power, right? Sometimes they go a little too far. So um, when I went to world championships, I put this extra long crank arm on my bike because I wanted to compete against these other crazy people. And my knee felt it, but I just ignored it. <laughs> um, so you'll feel it. Across the entire knee, patellar tendon, everything else. I took it off, by the way. I went back to my shoulder. Okay, <laughs> um, Internally rotated cleats, again. So you gotta look at the cleats. Externally rotated cleats. So internally rotated cleats will put cause tibial rotation stress, anterior knee stress, patellar tendinosis. Externally rotated stress will, will transmit that force to your medial knee. So I have some people who just feel medial knee pain, um, and there's nothing structurally wrong, and all we have to do is adjust things, and they're good to go. Uh, crank arm, uh, which you Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Uh, okay, pictures for fun. Maybe. Okay, so here's some things you see. So sometimes you lose arthritis, so sometimes you have to address that. You know, for this, you might change your position a little bit so that they're, you know, that if their cleats externally rotated or if they have medial knee arthritis, then maybe you'll internally rotate their cleat a little bit more to take some of the stress off. Um, if, and you've got to look, that's actually my husband's MRI. Um, that's his sister. <laughs> yeah, I'll look at, um, you know, sometimes you need MRI if you're not getting relief, if you're changing positions. Um, sometimes they can have a fracture or a stress fracture just from too much force. And so this is a fracture of the uh, medial tibial plateau slash. This looks like, not open growth plates, but this might be somebody who's a little bit younger. So in the area of the growth plate area. Usually a medial tibial plateau fracture would come in along here. So this is probably a young person, maybe an 18, 19 year old guy whose growth plates are just about closed and you get, you're getting physical stress and fracture around that area. Um, what is this guy? Oh, you can have osteochondral defects or osteochondral lesions. Uh, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see that okay, but here you can see you can develop osteochondral defects, so you wanna watch out for that. You can get some pre-patellar bursitis. That's no fun either, although that's usually not too bad. They usually ignore that until it's like, the size of a softball because it doesn't usually hurt too bad it's just uh, ugly looking and annoying and so they don't come into me when it's like <laughs> like a softball and I'm like why don't you just put a needle in it and drain it yourself because you guys are all crazy and they would uh, <laughs> well, favorite thing. There, it's not cute. okay getting there neuropathy um, I don't see too much of this uh, but it is out there and probably because they end up thinking, oh, I haven't, you know, I feel nerve pain, I'll go to a neurologist. But I know it is out there. I do see it on occasional. You can get ulnar neuropathy from positioning. Um, you see that actually more in road bikers than you do in triathletes. Because triathletes put their arms on the arrow bars, their forearms on the arrow bars, and then they angle their hands up a little bit to grab onto the the frame of the arrow bar or the, the handles of the arrow bar. And so when they angle up like that, they're taking the pressure off. Now they are stretching that area. So they're stretching the area of the ulnar nerve. So they might get a little like neuroplastic injury, but they aren't put, it's not a compression force because they're not compressing it. I know it's in on my bike every once in a while. I just have to kind of shake it off and change positions a little bit. I tell people it's really easy when they're in that position for a long time, just take your wrists and roll them around, you know, every once in a while. So. You know, when you set your alarm for shutting your neck, roll your wrists around too. Um, that's really easy to do. Um, but uh, it's usually the deep palmar branch of the ulnar nerve. So you just want them to reposition their hands a lot. There are padded gloves that you can get for it to try and protect it. The other area is the pudendal nerve. So if you get like a fibroma or if you have extended period of time on the saddle, you can get a pudendal neuropathy. Um, you can also get traumatic urethritis, um, so because of just positioning and stuff. So more in guys, believe it or not, they get the traumatic urethritis, and so they'll have they'll have 
blood in their urine and it'll hurt and it'll burn. It's not a UTI, it's just traumatic injury. Um, so it's a lot of times seat hang has to do with it. So <laughs> if their if their hamstrings are tight and the guys trying the bike fitters trying to fix it by angling their seat up a little bit, they could be putting stress on their urethra or their pudendal nerve. Um, so pudendal neuropathy will give them numbness in the penis and scrotum area. Um, you don't want to be this dude. <laughs> so if, you, if you get a pudendal entrapment, it is pretty tough to treat, especially if you develop a fibroma around it. So sometimes you need decompression of that nerve, which isn't fun. Okay, so we're talking about bike fit, bike fit, bike fit, bike fit. So what can we do to make sure that our athletes are ready to be on the bike and, and and be in that on bike position. Well, what you want to assess is their flexibility through their cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, pelvis, hamstrings, IT band, knee, and their angle, their ankle dorsiflexion. Um, so when they're pushing down, their ankle should be in a completely neutral position, and they should come at the bottom of the pedal stroke to even five, even ten if possible, but five is good, five degrees of dorsiflexion. If they don't have it, then, then they're not going to do, they're not, first of all, they're not going to generate the power that they need, and second of all, they're going to put too much stress on other structures. So you want to assess those things. Um, if those things are off, then you want to address that. Um, yeah, you also have to have the correct strength to be able to maintain the cervical extension, so those postural exercises we were talking about. You need scapular stabilization, so when you're in that position for a long time, um, you want to make sure that things aren't shifting or moving around. You want that scapula stable, so... That is kind of your lock and load mechanisms. That's a great therapy treatment. Actually, when people have shoulder problems, I tell them, um, stop swimming and get on your bike more because putting yourself in that position will give proprioceptive feedback when you're getting a closed kinetic chain activity up through to the shoulder and the scapular stabilizers. And so one of my treatments for swimmers with shoulder problems who are triathletes is I put them on the bike more. So get on the bike more, get in that position, it's going to help to stabilize your, your scapula. Um, you want to as neutral of a lumbar spine as possible. You want to try and create a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt, not a dramatic amount. You still want a horizontal spine all the way through, but a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt as opposed to posterior will put them in a better position when they're on the bike. Um, and hip pelvic disassociation just means that your muscles aren't working together well. So here's my hubby. Here's exercises that I make people do. Um, so one exercise you can do is just, you can just get into that position. So I have them put their arms out, have them get a slight bend in their knees, about that eight degree of knee flexion like you would recreate on the bike. And I just have them hold, first uh, stable on the ground, right? With just no, no stress or no balancing um, issues. And then I have them work their scapular stabilizers. Um, in that position. You want to recreate it in that position. So I'll have them work with chapter stabilizers, stabilizers with posterior row type of activity holding that position. Then we'll get them single leg holding that position. Uh, and then we'll get them, challenge them with balance exercises in that position and holding that position. And I try and have them do that. Have all bikers, I, can, I, I recommend that in the off season, when they're base training and their volume's a little bit lower, in the off season that they do this more often, so twice a week, and then in the regular season, once a week down to once every other week because they just don't have time otherwise. Um, and you don't really, once you create that muscle memory and, and you just reinforce it once a week, or every, I prefer once a week, but a lot of times I can only get every other week, so I take what I can get. <laughs> so, all right. So, summarizing. Um, cycling injuries, what's often called, are most often uh, occur for similar underlying reasons. So find the cause. You'll find it. You have, sometimes it takes a little bit of time in terms of the history, asking them questions about it. I don't have my cyclists bring in their bikes to look because I don't have time. I'll have them take pictures and bring in pictures so I can see what they look like on the bike because most of them have trainers. I tell them to get set up on their trainer, bring me in pictures of what their positioning looks like. Um, and um, you be in touch with your fitters and your coaches. And so there's coaches that help with, with, with fitting people on the bike. There's people at the bike shops that help with this. So be in touch with them. Kind of have an idea of who has a better understanding of what's going on so that you know who you can send to and refer to. Um, evaluate their training regimen. Just be cautious when they have a coach, you know, talk to their coach about this and work with them about 
you know, do we need to alter? Do we need to modify? Is there too much stress going on right now? Especially if they have an injury. Um, this isn't just preventative, but if, I do see a lot of people for preventative purposes. But if there's an injury, then you really want to look at that training regimen pretty closely and see what you need to modify. Um, obviously, do a musculoskeletal and functional movement screen. Um, and again, I recommend that all triathletes get an evaluation by a healthcare professional. So before they go buy an expensive bike, before they get their running shoes and all this expensive fancy gear, we can give good input to them in terms of what we recommend. Because and you know, even if you don't know exactly what type of bike you think they should get, a road bike versus a tri bike, or you know, Brooks running shoe versus a Saucony or stabilizer or a neutral shoe, you can at least say. This person has has planus. This person has tight hamstrings. Please, you know, you know, consider that when you're picking a bike or doing the fit. So you can at least write that down and give those considerations. Um, and just educate the athlete on the importance of staying on top of these things. Oh, there's my husband after Pocono's half Ironman, and my daughter who was freezing and ready to go home. <laughs> All right, questions. Covered it all. Awesome. All right, I'll be here if you guys have anything. Okay. When you see these patients come in with back pain, what is your threshold of frequency at which you order? So I kind of, um, it just a, a lot of factors that go into play. So the question was, when do you order radiological studies? Um, it, it age plays a pretty big role. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where. The textbook says 55 and older or so, right, for x-rays, bless you. Um, or if there's a history, a family history of cancer, maybe you get x-rays a little bit sooner. Um, if we want to consider something like an MRI, then we have to have x-rays first, right? So a lot, I don't always get x-rays. Matter of fact, yesterday, I think out of my eight new patients, I think I only got one x-ray on eight new patients. So age is probably the biggest factor. Physical exam, if I have, if I see something suspicious on physical exam, if I'm doing, let's say, the hip, a, a hip scour test, and they're getting a lot of groin pain, I'll probably get an x-ray to make sure there's not any arthritis if they're, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years old, especially if there's a family history of arthritis. And so it really is dependent on the patient and mm -hmm. on the scenario. Knee pain, I'm often, especially if they're under the age of 40, I'm often not getting, I'm not often not getting x-rays because there's not really too much that you're going to be looking for um, unless you try modifying their fit and doing some therapy and they're not getting there and they come back and they say I still have pain and you get the x-ray you don't see anything so then you consider ordering an MRI and sometimes you'll pick up things like that OCD lesion that one that we saw here was advanced a lot of times you'll catch it in the early stages before it goes on to having um, re or uh, x-ray findings so if you can catch it in the MRI stage when it's early you can stop it you're not really going to stop it in a triathlete because you're going to sit there and tell them your knee hurts and you have an OCD lesion and you have to take off and they're going to laugh and walk out the door. But you tell them the risk factors and it's their life. They can only, you can only convince them so much. And so you do what you can. You tell them the risk factors and out they go. I have lots of athletes. I have a professional triathlete right now with a, a terrible patellar tendinopathy. All kinds of calcifications visible, mid-substance patellar tendinopathy. But this is her. She's a professional. This is her life her season's not over for another month and so she's just every race taking that chance and taking that chance and taking that chance and then the off season is going to come next month and her off season is going to be a little bit shortened because she her this season extended a little bit further than she thought it was going to so now she's going to look at her schedule and say well now my off season's this short now i don't have time to do it in the off season either and she's going to ignore it even more and even more so all i can do is say here's your risk factors i can't twist your arm to do this. You know, you have, and usually a patellar tendon that looks like that, or Achilles tendon looks like that, has like a 30% chance of rupture if you keep on putting that much intense repetitive stress on it. So I tell them, hey, and you could be out there, you have a 30% chance of that guy rupturing. You know, go make some money. <laughs> so, and that's, and she's a, she's a new professional triathlete, so she uh, doesn't have good insurance. She's got shitty insurance, and so it's, a, it's hard for her to get these ex covered. She's actually trying to do these races to build up the funding to fix her knee. I mean, it's like, you know, these are the things we deal with in the real world. Um, so and she's going to be probably paying mostly cash because of high deductibles and everything else. And so we're negotiating rates and all kinds of stuff to, to do treatment on her. So I don't know how we got on that subject. But um, <laughs> um, next question. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you do much um, 
ultrasound yourself in the office? Mm -hmm. We do a lot of ultrasound in the office, um, uh, lots and lots of ultrasound. In my ultrasound machine, I have another one that I'm using right now, but I, I'll use ultrasound for a lot of purposes. It's great for dynamic imaging to see the IT band if it's snapping over the ilio, or over the prior trochanter. My newer one, you can see the iliopsoas snapping over the iliopectineal eminence, which is great. So you can use it for a lot of things. Knee pain in a triathlete, you're probably not going to see too much unless it's a patellar tendon. Um, or unless there's fluid underneath the IT band because they have that IT band friction syndrome. And sometimes you will see that fluid accumulation under there. As a matter of fact, I'd say about 50% of the time you'll see that fluid accumulation under there. And that raises the question, is there a bursa at the distal IT band? Have you guys heard any of that debate? Is not, is there, isn't there? So some, some uh, uh, anatomists think that there is uh, a bursa at the distal IT band and some think it's just more like a tenosynovitis because the IT band is almost like a tendon in nature. But that, so we can visualize that on ultrasound. So there's a lot we can do ultrasound wise for sure. Anything else? All right guys, well I'll be here if you have any other questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Hey, I'm Mike. I'm one of the PGY2s. Nice, nice, nice to meet you, Mike. I'm Katie. Nice to meet you. Thank um, you. So my undergrad was in athletic training and sports med, and I'm looking to do Sweet. sports med in the future. Awesome. I was wondering if I assume you don't have a whole lot of time now, but I was wondering if I'm going to be able to email sometime with some questions about you know your path to <laughs> sports med and, and yeah. questions about your you know day to day business that kind of stuff. Would yeah. That be okay? Yeah, for sure. Um, can I grab his paper right there? Yeah, right. absolutely. Oh yeah. So I got pulled out. I'm going to go over there. Yeah, how was your response? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, amazing bagel. I knew. It's usually what it is. I was like, I have a feeling it's probably just amazing. How's your It's pretty good. Yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah, I didn't really take the time off that I was supposed to. So, but it's. Did they? Did you? I don't think so. They didn't say. Do you remember the name? Mike. Mike. Yeah, just. Not yet. How long ago? Okay. Okay. I'll keep an eye out.